quite a long time ago now, when many boys and girls who are now leaving school had not yet even entered kindergarten, the state of New South Wales decided that they were going to build a new palace of culture to demonstrate that the city of Sydney was no less refined than the city of London or the city of Paris or the city of New York. They decided to build a grand new house for the opera. They chose a site on the waterfront, just a little upstream from Sydney Harbour Bridge where every visitor would be bound to see. And they held a grand competition open to the architects of all the world to decide exactly what manner of a building they should put there. They made only one condition, that nothing quite so remarkable should ever have been built before. At the beginning of January 1957, they began to sort the entries. A couple of weeks later, they announced the winner. Jorn Utzon of Denmark emerged triumphant. The Americans, who had come second, had submitted a circular design. The British, who had come third, had submitted a rectangular one. But the design of Yawn was neither square, nor circle, nor rectangle, nor polygon, nor even a parallelopiped. It was a score of towering shells. It was a cluster of seagulls spreading concrete wings. It was a huddle of sailing boats with billowing concrete sails. And it was an unmitigated bitch to build. This was his creation. From the first, it stirred the people of Sydney to breathless wonder and scalding abuse. It was called the Sydney Harbour Monster, a piece of Danish pastry, a disintegrating circus tent. At first count, it was the cheapest of the prize-winning designs, 3.5 million Australian pounds. They began collecting in 1957, and two years later, in spite of a 100,000 pound gift from the government, they had not yet raised half a million in donations. Luckily, someone had a bright idea. They launched the Opera House Lottery with the first prize of £100,000 and tickets at £3 each. And Sydneyites being what they are, as soon as the Opera House was something you could place a bet on, its money troubles were over. They've been queuing up to pay for the Opera House in their thousands ever since. Last year, the Opera House Lottery raised £8 million. But money was the littlest of the Opera House troubles. Right from the beginning, the house was full of trouble. Human, mechanical, structural. Troubles of a kind that couldn't be solved simply by issuing wads of numbered tickets. They began with the site itself. The Minister of Transport was using it as a tram depot and it took years to persuade him to give it up. At last, in 1958, when they had got rid of the trams and they wanted to begin building, they found the site was neither big enough nor strong enough to carry that structure that seemed on paper light enough to fly away. They had to extend the site on three sides by building a concrete deck. The whole site had to be reinforced by concrete piers, 550 of them, each three feet in diameter, driven right down to bedrock 70 feet below the surface of the water. But all these were milk-tooth troubles compared with the ones that were to come when they started on the roof. They had to change their ideas first about materials. At one time, the idea was for a roof of steel coated with concrete, until somebody thought about the noise, and somebody else thought about the climate. Apparently, with that design, the Opera House stars would have been singing above the sirens of the tugboats on the water outside, and the temperature variations would have caused the metal and concrete to rumble and crack like tropical thunder. So the roof had to be redesigned in reinforced concrete. This meant the concrete pillars already built were no longer strong enough, and they had to be demolished and built again. Those great arching shells of Utzon's design, the highest of them rising to 179 feet, no doubt looked mightily impressive on paper. There was just one thing. In reinforced concrete, nobody could actually build them. Eventually, they loaded a computer with a program of a million analyses, enough work to last a competent mathematician for 44 years. It produced the answer that they could build something very like Utzon's marvel if they worked with sections of a sphere 248 feet 8.2 inches in diameter. Using spherical segments, the concrete could be precast and set in position piece by piece. By 1962, the cost had risen to 12.5 million pounds. And now everybody admitted they were only guessing. The opening day was postponed and postponed again. It had been planned for Australia Day, 1963. It was put off until early 1964, 
then until sometime in 1966, and now no one is bold enough even to predict the year the doors may eventually open. The frustrations have led not only to political strife, the workers on site have grown bitchy too. Last July, it was reported that during the previous 12 months, there had been 350 stoppages, almost one a day. 57,000 man-hours had been lost, including 4,000 to acquire better showers and lavatories. In Sydney, comments have become even sourer. One correspondent complained lately that the unfinished opera house was mouldering on like the bones of a vast prehistoric animal. The man who has to stand up and face all this discordant music is Mr. P.M. Ryan, the Minister for Public Works. I interviewed him on the day he had just unveiled the latest development in the saga, a sectional model of the completed building. Mr. Ryan, when you talk to many people on the streets in Sydney on the subject of the Opera House, they're likely to explode for one reason and another. Uh, the first one they seem to criticise is the increased cost. Now, why has the cost soared so much since it was begun? Well, I don't think it really has, Mr. Philpott. I think this uh, is an exaggerated situation that has been generated by publicity from uninformed sources. I think the people of Sydney and the people of Australia are really proud of what we are attempting here in this very great building. Uh, the costs have increased, but not out of proportion to costs in even an orthodox building. Was this then these figures that we read in the paper, we, uh, from 3.5 million up to 17.5 million Australian pounds, is, uh, are these figures wrong? Is well, they are not wrong, but they give a completely incorrect impression. The estimate of 3.5 million pounds mentioned so often uh, was never ever intended to be an estimate of completed cost. Neither was the reported figure of 4.8 million pounds. The only firm estimate ever given on uh, information at the time was 12 and a half million pounds. And of course, since then, costs have risen, both labor and material, and uh, problems have uh, uh, developed in the construction because this is a completely unorthodox building. No precedent, no experience to guide the contractor, and he has to uh, more or less uh, plan as he goes along, particularly in the superstructure because this is a most difficult engineering problem. As a matter of fact, a problem that has never been attempted anywhere in the world before. You're quite sure it'll be all right? It'll stand up when it's built? Well, Mr. Philpott, as far as it is possible for engineering and architectural experience to indicate a conclusion, yes. Even the consulting engineer was reported lately as saying that he can't yet be sure whether it will be a colossal failure or a masterpiece. At one time, the Sydneyites made jokes about their opera house. They wrote comic songs about it, sailing away up the harbour on the first decent wind. Not anymore. They defend it now with the kind of passion with which a mother protects an idiot child. The gamblers of Sydney have paid £17.5 million for it. They'll be paying more. And at that price, it's beyond a joke.